three qualities that the Buddha listed as the sources for unskillful behavior. is greed, anger, yeah. or aversion, and delusion. And some psychotherapists have asked why he didn't list fear as the fourth. Psychotherapy is devoted to rooting out neurotic fear. Why did the Buddha have the same approach? It's because he saw that fear has its uses. It's not always unskillful. You go into a forest, it's right to be fearful. If you get complacent, you can die. When you think about your own mortality, how fragile your life is, how fragile your health is, how fleeting your youth is, it's right to feel a certain amount of fear. Think of the Buddha when he was still a young prince, the famous story of how he saw an old person a sick person, an old person, a dead person, and the fear he felt realizing that all the areas he looked for happiness in life were subject to aging, illness, and death as well. And the feeling he felt on that, seeing these called Sangwega, which is sometimes translated as urgency, sometimes a sense of dismay. But it can also be translated as a terror, looking into the abyss and seeing you're going to fall into it. But the story doesn't stop there. The fourth person he saw was a forest mendicant, and the feeling he felt on that was, was confidence. If there's a way out, this is it. And that din dynamic between terror and confidence that informs all the Buddhist teachings, all the Buddhist practice. Which means that a sense of fear is a legitimate the practice, a legitimate motivation for wanting to get your mind to settle down, gain immense, some insight into why you're suffering. Because you realize that if you don't gain control over your mind when aging, illness, and death come, you'll be at a total loss. But you have the confidence that if the mind is trained, then you can handle these things and not suffer. So fear is a legitimate reason for coming to the practice, and probably it's the most legitimate of all. We don't like the feeling of fear. The experience of fear is very uncomfortable. We feel small and weak, and it becomes unskillful when it gets mixed up with greed, aversion, and delusion. But a clear-sighted sense of fear combined with confidence that there is a way out. That can actually get you on the path. That combination of fear and confidence is what translates into what the Buddha said is the root of all skillful behavior, heedfulness. You realize that there are dangers, but if you're careful, you can avoid them. If the dangers were totally unavoidable, there'd be no reason to be heedful. And if there were no dangers at all, there'd be no reason to be heedful. There are dangers in life. And it turns out it's not so much the aging, illness, and death, but it's the way we think about things, our greed, and aversion, and delusion. These are the dangers. But 
but then the care with which we learn how to manage our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. That's the way around the dangers. So heedfulness reminds us of the dangers, but says, if you're careful, if you're mindful, if you're alert, if you're discerning, you can gain release from those dangers. So that's why we're here meditating, learning how to train the mind. So that it can recognize greed and anger and delusion when they come. This is a large part of the problem right there, is we don't recognize these qualities. Because delusion, by definition, can't see itself, and often it gets mixed up with the greed and the anger, so you don't recognize what's happening. To get past that, you have to learn how to observe your own mind. To sense what you're doing that's skillful and what you're doing that's not. And to do that, you have to observe your thoughts to see where they lead. This is something we don't normally do. When we get involved in the thought world, we're totally in that world. Try to shape it to the, whatever way we like. And for one reason or another, we drop that and move to another one, and then another one. It's like hopping trains. And if you ever try to trace the trains of your thought, See, it's a lot more complicated than the railroad network here in America. You hop on a train of thought, find yourself in Burma, find yourself in England, find yourself in the middle of Russia, up to the North Pole, down to the South Pole, out to Mars and Saturn. With brief stops for when you're feeling hungry, when you're feeling hot. And it's back and forth all over the place. And when our thoughts are totally out of control like this, no wonder they cause suffering. Because they can latch on to an object and worry it to death, and worry us to death. And unless the mind is trained, it has very little ability to step back and see what's going on. What you want to learn how to do is see where your thoughts go. In other words, you step out of the thought and see. This is a part of a causal process. This thought leads to that reaction, that reaction leads to that thought, that thought leads to that reaction, and so on. But you also want to see how the thought gets put together. Why do thoughts arise to begin with? When you understand these processes, then you can step back and if you notice that a particular thought is leading in a direction that's going to cause you suffering, you can drop it. You can disband it. The more alert, the more mindful you are, the more quickly you can do this until you get to the point where even if there's just a brief stirring of a thought, even before it becomes a coherent thought, you can zap it. You recognize that this is going to go off in an unskillful direction, and you stop it in its tracks. These are some of the skills you develop as you meditate. This is one of the reasons why we start with the breath. start by thinking about the breath. Because if you keep your thoughts concerned with something right here in the present moment, you can start to see the processes of thinking, what they call fabrication. The breath is what's called bodily fabrication. It's what helps to create your sense of the body, the way you feel the body from within. And then you combine that with directed thought and evaluation, which are called verbal fabrication. In other words, you keep directing your thoughts to the breath, and then you evaluate it. How does this breath feel? Is it comfortable? If it's not comfortable, then you can change it. This brings in the other level of fabrication, which is mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. Your perceptions are the labels you apply to things. 
In the case of the breathing process, it has to do with how you perceive what's going on when you breathe. What pulls the breath in? What pushes it out? When you visualize the breathing process to yourself, what is that visualization like? Is it helpful or does it actually cause harm? If you think of the body as a bellows, pulling the breath in, pushing it out, it's going to make the breathing process tedious, tiresome. You learn how to perceive the breathing process more as an energy flow. And it's not just the air in and out of the lungs, but it's the quality of the energy in the body as a whole, from the top of the head, down to the face, down to the torso, down to the legs, and down the shoulders and out the arms. The whole body is involved in this quality of breath, breathing, energy flow. And the body is wired in such a way that it could actually pick up energy from anywhere. It doesn't have to come in with the air. In fact, the air is coming in and out is simply a byproduct of the energy flow in the body. Try to hold that perception in mind and see what it does for the breathing. If that gets too complicated, just get back to directing your thoughts to the breath and evaluating the breath and leave it there. But as you get more sensitive to the full process of fabrication, begin to realize what you're doing is creating a thought world here, but it includes the body. Breath, which is bodily fabrication, directed thought and evaluation, and verbal fabrication, and your thoughts and perceptions, mental fabrication, they're all right here. And when they're all right here, then you're in a better position to see how do thoughts form. How do they disintegrate? Where do they lead? Because it's inevitable as you try to focus on the breath that other thoughts will come up. And in the beginning, you realize that only after they're taking you far away. You find yourself on the coast of Norway, so how did I get here? And at the beginning, you, you don't want to trace it back yet. Just say, okay, I've got to go back to the breath. And fortunately, you don't have to travel every inch of the way from Norway back here. You just drop Norway, and you're right here, back with the breath. And the next thought, you're in Africa. Okay, drop that, come back to the breath. The next thought, you're thinking about tomorrow's meal. Drop that, come back to the breath. And an unskillful reaction to all of this is to get frustrated. The skillful reaction is to begin to realize, well, this is a, what the mind has been doing all along. And so it's, it's going to take time for it to change its habits. The important lesson also to draw is that not to be surprised when the mind wanders off like that. Learn to anticipate it. You realize, okay, it's going to wander off again. Watch for the warning signs. Has, how does it happen that a sudden curtain falls over the mind and then when the curtain is pulled up you're off someplace else, as in a play? The curtain drops on Act 1 and suddenly it rises again, you're in Act 2 and you're off someplace else. How and why does the mind hide these things from itself? And how do you know that it's about to happen? When you can anticipate that it's about to happen, there'll be a sense of irritation or boredom or antsiness in the mind. And even though you're with the breath, it's beginning to look someplace else. When you can catch that happening, remind yourself the best way to deal with it is to make the breath more comfortable. It's a sign that breath isn't interesting enough, isn't comfortable enough. Start asking yourself more questions about the breath. How could it be more comfortable? What kind of breathing would feel really good right now? You can ask the different parts of the body. Hand. What kind of breathing would feel good for you? Left hand, right hand, stomach, legs, chest, abdomen. And then let them breathe in whatever way 
they like. The more interesting the breathing process, the more comfortable and satisfying, refreshing, the less likely the mind is going to wander off. And the more easily it will come back. So what you're doing as you practice breath meditation like this is you take your, your fears of what could happen to you. Death comes, aging comes, illness comes. Somebody drops you off in the middle of nowhere in the dark. How could you keep your mind under control so you wouldn't suffer? which are all realistic fears, but then you combine that with a confidence, okay, you can manage your mind, you can learn how to train the mind. It's this combination of fear and confidence, that what, that's what constitutes heedfulness, which is the basis for the whole path. You become heedful to try to develop skillful qualities, i.e. qualities of mind that will lead to good results, lead you away from suffering and to abandon and avoid unskillful qualities, the ones that cause suffering. If you develop your mindfulness, your alertness, your concentration, you can do this. So fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's an important part of wisdom, recognizing that there are dangers in life. It's a necessary function of the mind, anticipating that dangers are going to happen. The important thing is not to let it get tied up in greed, aversion, and delusion. You want to bring more mindfulness, more clarity to the issues that you fear, and gain more skill in the qualities that will help, help you avoid those dangers, because that's the important message of the Buddhist teaching. You have to saw that forest mendicant, he became a forest mendicant himself to test, to see if that confidence he placed in that style of life was really well placed. And this way can prove that it was. It is possible to find a happiness which is not touched by aging, illness, death, separation. And as I would have said, it came not through any special qualities on his part came through developing qualities of mind that we all have, or that we all can develop, ardency, alertness, heedfulness, learning how to be resolute in the path. So don't hate your fears. learn how to educate them. When they're educated and trained, they're part of the path to the end of suffering. This is part of the Buddhist genius. He took the things that many of us don't like about the mind, the things that actually cause trouble in the mind. And he said you can tame them, you can train them, so they actually become part of the path to the end of suffering. So you can reach a place in the mind where there really is no more reason to fear. Just as Ananda said, you use desire to come to the end of desire. In the same way you can use fear, treat it wisely, to bring yourself to the end of fear. And it turns out that's the only way you can get there. <laughs> 